Long before there was even a tease of a potential remake, the speculative discourse surrounding it seemed to always hover around the same conclusion. Resident Evil 4 doesn't need to be remade. It's perfect as it is. Any attempts to replicate it would be redundant at best, and completely miss the point of what made the original so iconic at worst. Personally, I've come to the realization that art doesn't need to justify its own existence at all. Art can, in fact, exist for the sole purpose of existing. I do understand the argument against remakes. I've held similar views on multiple video games and films in the past, and I think it's perfectly valid to be concerned about how a remake could affect the reputation and preservation of the original. After all, there are remakes which seemingly aim to replace the original work. The Dead Space remake, released two months before the remake of Resident Evil 4, is essentially the same game as the 2008 version. The only major changes, apart from the drastic leap in visual fidelity, are all in favor of fixing things. The protagonist, space engineer Isaac Clarke, never speaks in the first game. But he does in the sequels, which made for quite an odd transition in terms of canonical cohesion, so now he does in the remake. The script is slightly altered to better connect to parts of the series' lore that, at the time, had not yet been written. The enemies are controlled by a Left 4 Dead-style AI director, which creates ebbs and flows of enemy encounters depending on the player's performance, making the scares slightly less predictable. And the criticized zero-gravity sections, where Isaac previously had to aim and launch himself in a straight line in order to move from one end of a room to another, now allow you to control him in all his three-dimensional glory. Again, like in the sequels. The Dead Space remake is not a one-to-one -one recreation, but it's fairly close, and the particular ways it differentiates itself from the source material kind of makes you question whether there's a reason to ever go back to playing the original. This might be what more faithful remakes want you to think. Although, it only ever makes sense within a strictly capitalist context, where video games are consumable products first and art second where games are viewed as software to be infinitely improved upon in an impossible pursuit of perfection. It's an aspect that is hard to ignore, considering that we're living in a largely capitalist society, where new remakes of video games, films, and TV shows are announced with the cynical frequency of raindrops falling from the sky. I believe that the artistic merits of remakes are very much worth discussing, though, and there are few examples which are as good as the Resident Evil remakes. The draw of video game remakes is that we expect them to give us the comfort only nostalgic familiarity can provide. Yet it's this attitude that gives remakes such an excellent opportunity to subvert our expectations. This works especially well for games which have such a legendary reputation that almost anyone would know what to expect. Although, I'd argue that it works best for horror games, which can rewrite and remix pivotal scenes from the past in order to use the same old scares to frighten players all over again. The most famous part of the original Resident Evil, aside from it famously giving birth to the label of survival horror, is, of course, the dog crashing through the window scene. The iconic status of this jump scare made its inclusion in the remake inevitable. But without the element of surprise, it would just have been an acknowledgement of its original impact. Not a very frightening moment in its own right. So when you enter that all too familiar corridor, you know it's going to happen at any second. Except it doesn't. The loud crashing of the window is replaced with the faint sound of cracking glass. Suddenly, you have no idea when the dogs are coming. If at all. They eventually do, of course. Although not until you've further explored the mansion, by which point you might have forgotten all about it and let your guard down. Only to be blindsided by those same old doggies from 1996. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. This scene is genius, even better than the original, but only because the original preceded it. In a sense, the symbiotic relationship between these two games are more like that of sequels than different interpretations of the same source material. Meta-sequels, I guess you could call- oh, whoa, shit. 
I feel like that was a bad omen or something. Meta sequels, I guess you could call them. You'll have to have played the original to fully appreciate the changes in the remake. Especially the changes that are directly crafted for fans of the original game. By playing both, you'll also find how the differences highlight their respective limitations and flaws as well as their strengths. This is even more evident in the remake of Resident Evil 2. Is the book gonna fall down again? I can hear the book moving. <laughs> Many fans wish that this one would be in the vein of the first remake, which preserved the traditional tank controls and fixed camera angles. What they got instead merged the story, setting, and characters of the original Resident Evil 2 and the over-the-shoulder action-type gameplay of Resident Evil 4. While I do prefer the low-poly aesthetic of the original game to this more photorealistic look, something I've made a whole other video about, the updated graphics in this remake, as well as its changes to gameplay, have their own fair share of artistic benefits. What the remake lacks in uncanny abstractions of the human form, it more than makes up for with highly detailed and satisfyingly gross body horror. Shots from any of your weapons play the risk of blowing patches of skin or even bones off of the game's many stumbling zombies. I used to have two legs and now I don't. Amazing! Two legs? Who needs them? I have zero! And that's the best, thanks to Leon. The ability to aim guns freely this time around gives the player a larger sense of control over their in-game avatar, but it's balanced by having those same zombies be tough as nails to take down permanently, or even temporarily. The villain character with the slightly goofy name of Mr. X is now a Starker-type enemy that will show up at random intervals to put even more pressure on the player. A clear response to similarly effective stalkers of the franchise's past, like Nemesis and the Baker family. The Resident Evil 2 remake is so different in the way it plays that it successfully avoids undercutting the uniqueness of the original. Instead, it stands as a companion piece. The purpose it fills, from a purely artistic perspective, is to make something out of every lesson learned from all the mainline Resident Evil games that came before. Meanwhile, the original Resident Evil 2 remains, for anyone who wants to explore the same narrative within a completely different framework. The aspect of remakes that interests me the most is the way they can fulfill a whole bunch of what-ifs. Not just what if this old game got a facelift, but what if the mechanics were changed? What if the story received a tonal shift? What would happen then? The original Resident Evil 4 was once the subject of this kind of speculation, one of the earliest showings of the game, a version which is now commonly referred to as Resident Evil 3.5 or the Hookman demo, depicts a vastly different experience from the one we ultimately got. Some of it is familiar. Leon's bomber jacket, the shift on over-the-shoulder camera when he aims his pistol, the night statues coming to life. Check, check, and check. The possessed dolls and the hook-wielding ghost man who steps out of a painting? No checks there. Resident Evil has never been a franchise that has dabbled in the supernatural, unless you count Chris Redfield's inhuman ability to punch large boulders. Resident Evil Village came close with House Beneviento, which did contain some possessed dolls. But even then there was, as there usually is, a perfectly rational explanation for all of it. Bioweapons. It's, it's always bioweapons. 3.5 wasn't just different due to its seemingly paranormal angle, though. It was scary. Even as a passive observer, it's hard not to be a little unnerved by it. The game that came out obviously prioritized action over horror. But that early look at what could have been left fans with a lingering question. What if Resident Evil 4 had been a proper horror game? The Resident Evil 4 remake finally answers this question. Sort of. And it doesn't withhold the answer for long. Right from the start, the game reveals its intention to not just subvert the tone of the original, but the expectations of the player. The 2005 version starts off with protagonist Leon being dropped off at a small cabin by two Spanish police officers. Within mere minutes of arriving, Leon shoots and kills several members of the local population, and his ride violently crashes to the bottom of a cliff. Meanwhile, the remake doesn't even allow the player to draw Leon's gun until it deems it narratively fitting to do so. 
Anyone who has played the original would fully expect the first encounter with an enemy to go something like this. Leon enters the cabin, its evil resident turns around, Leon shows the photograph of the president's daughter, the man grabs an axe, swings and misses, Leon tells him to freeze and BAM! Combat commences. The remake straight up robs the player of their agency during this first encounter by relegating all of it to a cutscene. Leon doesn't even shoot his gun, he kicks the man who proceeds to fall, break his neck, and instantly flatline. Frankly, it's a little underwhelming. Maybe even worrying for players fearing that the game will remove control from other classic moments further down the line. However, it's not without reason. As the player descends into the basement, they'll find one of Leon's police escorts dead. And judging from his radio, the other one doesn't seem to be having the best time either. The basement is a dead end, so the player has no choice but to turn around and walk back up the stairs. Then, suddenly, the man Leon lethally kissed with the sole of his boot is back for round two. Broken neck and all, and he is pissed. No fucking way. Way. <laughs> This is how the first interactive fight starts in the RE4 remake. And the game does this not just in service of making itself new and exciting as a meta sequel to the original game, but to warn the player that it will try to scare them again, when they least expect it. Does this twist undermine the proper reveal of the Las Plagas parasite later on? Maybe. But this is a meta sequel. Those who would be bothered by this change are already aware of what's to come. What they weren't expecting was that it would reveal itself this early. Then there is arguably the best moment of both the original Resident Evil 4 and the remake. The village fight. At first they look fairly similar, both in their visual and gameplay design. However, with a controller in hand, the difference is almost night and day. In the original game, enemies would awkwardly, albeit menacingly, start to move slower as they got closer to Leon, in order to make it easier for the player to shoot them. This made sense because Leon wasn't able to move and shoot at the same time, and if enemies were constantly running, it would likely have been too much of a hassle to try and strategically shoot specific body parts or weak spots. Now, Leon can move and shoot, meaning that the game's enemies need to adapt to the change, which they do by being significantly more aggressive. They will rush you, strangle you, even restrain you while one of their pals start practicing their hay poking skills on your tummy. The enemies do slow down occasionally, but now that you know how aggressive they can be, you might not underestimate them as much. The ability to switch between weapons and other items on the fly disincentivizes the player from repeatedly pausing the game to play No Time Limit Tetris in Leon's Atashi case. You'll still do it at times, probably. But this change makes it so that you're more engaged with the fight. You get less breathers, less time to think and react. On top of that, there will be the occasional curveball, like the tower where the floor suddenly collapses under Leon's feet, which, if you're unlucky, will have him land in a whole flock of angry villagers. This is the beauty of the Resident Evil 4 remake. It knows exactly what to change to make familiar players rethink their strategies and what should remain the same. The remake never goes full on RE 3.5 with its horror, unfortunately. But it does try to keep that unspoken promise of going in a more horror-focused direction almost all the way to the end. As much as a generally faithful recreation of Resident Evil 4 allows, anyway. Ammunition is more scarce, the stealth and parrying mechanics offer a new risk-reward dynamic which raises the tension even further, and the lighting and darker shadows help to emphasize the change in tone, even in some of the more well-lit areas. There's also a very subtle but cute nod to RE 3.5. During the section where you play as Ashley, a stuffed deer head falls off the wall. Although it's less bloody and... alive this time. While a part of me is a little disappointed that this remake didn't go for an even more radical reinterpretation of the original, by going so far as to actually include the ghost-like hookman from RE 3.5, the fact that it didn't only leaves more room for such interpretations to be made in the future. Unless some cataclysmic event ends life as we know it within the next, I don't know, 50 years? Resident Evil 4 will be remade again. And you know what? I think it should be. It doesn't even have to be remade by Capcom. The truth is that remakes, demakes, and remasters will happen, whether it's within the corporate world of high-budget AAA games or not.
Before the remake, there was the Resident Evil 4 HD project, started by Albert Martin and Chris Morales in 2014. These fans spent 13,000 hours across 8 years, with funds donated by other fans, on a painstakingly detailed remaster that surpasses the one Capcom themselves put out by a mile. Several miles, in fact. It's delightful that the option now exists, to play the original game with these impressively recreated high-resolution textures, some of which the devs had to physically find and photograph in the real world. And it's all thanks to people with no professional relation to the developers at Capcom, who took it upon themselves to make this mod, simply because they wanted to. Similarly, a Soul developer called Shigu Works attempted to recreate, at the very least, the vibe of Resident Evil 3.5 with their own Code Madman demo. There's footage on their YouTube channel where it seems like the Hookman, as well as some more content from the original demo, was going to be included at some point. Although none of it is in the version of Code Madman that is publicly available today. And currently it doesn't seem like it will be added anytime soon. That a fan recreation of an unfinished version of a Resident Evil game is equally unfinished is definitely ironic. What's important though is that Shigo Works, like Albert Martin and Chris Morales before them, made the effort at all. There was no monetary incentive, no intention to definitively replace a different piece of art. It was solely an attempt to finally give an answer to that tantalizing what if. The Resident Evil franchise is so uniquely fascinating to me, because it consists of so many renowned games, both finished and unfinished, that it has now reached a point where the developers at Capcom can spend years putting out games with the prime focus of self-reflecting on their own legacy. Personally, I hope they continue, even if some of those games turn out to be underwhelming. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis might be my favorite game in the whole franchise, and my partial disappointment in its remake only strengthened my love for the original. And like, what on earth would a remake of the catastrophically messy Resident Evil 6 even look like? I guess we're not going that way. That is a very compelling question that I honestly can't wait to be answered. I'm not a fan of the development studio Bloober Team, mainly because they tend to tackle the topic of mental health with the sensitivity and empathy of a bull in a psychiatrist's office. But a part of me wants to see what they can make of Silent Hill 2 with their remake. If it turns out to be as awful as people fear, the original Silent Hill 2 will still exist. It won't be as easy to get your hands on, especially on modern systems. But as long as the publishers at Konami refuse to do anything about that, it will always be morally acceptable to All the examples I've talked about, among several others, is the reason why I disagree with fellow essayist Jacob Geller about remakes being, quote, a slightly lower form of art than, oh. than new things. Don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of Jacob's work, and I can absolutely see his point. I'd also argue that it's generally better to strive towards making art that tries to explore the still unexplored, that isn't constrained by the conventions of an established formula or brand. But I also believe that remakes are a natural step in the progression of art, just like sequels. And who would argue that a game like Half-Life 2 is a lower form of art than Half-Life the First? Or Pathologic 2, which is both a sequel and a remake of its predecessor, possibly making it the most meta out of all meta sequels. Clearly, we will always want to try different things with art that has already been made. And personally, I don't think that the derivative nature of remakes make them lesser, or even less new. Not necessarily. Again, it's that expectation that video game remakes are going to offer more of the same, which leaves us open for subversive sucker punches. Hell, even when a remake doesn't try to be particularly subversive, like the Dead Space one, it still makes you reflect on the original work in a way you probably wouldn't have without the benefit of comparison. Isn't that what art is at least partially about? Making us reflect. Not just on our own thoughts and feelings, but on the art itself. New art has the power to move us. But remakes have the power to make us realize why something moved us in the first place. Or why a new version succeeds where a previous one failed in this regard. Horror is the most effective when we can't predict it. Which on paper makes the concept of a horror game remake pretty useless. In reality though, horror game remakes 
what I would consider to be good ones anyway, are effective because they disprove our predictions. Because they take pieces of horror-related art that with time have reached a point where they're almost comfortably familiar and twist them until the comfort is no longer there. There is this quote that is accredited to Leonardo da Vinci that reads, Art is never finished, only abandoned. However, with remakes, art is neither finished or abandoned. It's eventually abandoned by someone. But sometimes the allure of the torch is too great for other artists to not pick it up. And wouldn't it be a shame if no one did? Da Vinci's own magnum opus, The Mona Lisa, could possibly be the world's most famous painting. It's also one of the most reinterpreted pieces of art ever made. Hundreds of thousands of artists across literal centuries have been inspired to build upon this singular source material. This doesn't diminish the artistic value of the original piece. It enhances it immortalizes it. Resident Evil 4 didn't have to be remade. Nothing has to be remade. In fact, no art has to exist at all. Art exists because we want it, and because we want to express ourselves through it. While it's unlikely that the Resident Evil 4 remake will reinvent an entire genre of video games, it will forever remind us of why the original did. That does mean that it will always live in the shadow of its predecessor, at least in part. Maybe even in large part. However, the remake never had to be better or more iconic. It's simply an alternative way of experiencing a horror classic. One of two delicious looking cakes. And personally, I freaking love cake. <laughs> Mmm, support me on Patreon. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I want to give a special thanks to the endlessly generous people whose support has kept this channel going for three years now. Here are some of their names. Anade, Callum Wally, Eben Phantom, Franz Johannes Foilner, Hovard Kugerud, Jack Lightfoot, Jesse Earl, L. Tantevi, Lesser Sage of Stars, Martha C., Mackenzie Pollock, Nichtschwert, Nick Owens, Noah Fryman, Professor Flowers, Robin Hartz, Seth Sard, Silk Moth, TB Skyen, The Mighty Jin Jojo, Yuli Troyo, and Vinders. I also want to thank Kevin from the podcast Pixelit for lending his voice to the legless zombie, as well as Kiki from Transparency, Mira Cox, and VZ Shows for proofreading the script. You'll find all their links in the video description. I also want to give a shout out to Jacob Geller's video, We're Not Remaking Horror Games, We're Chasing Nightmares, which is a similar comparison type video where the remakes of Dead Space and Resident Evil 4 are discussed as well. Lastly, if you're watching this video during the time of its release, Happy Pride Month, everyone! To celebrate, I want to recommend that you find and watch a surprisingly queer-inclusive zombie film called Wild Zero. It's one of the most enjoyable films I've watched in years, with one of the best queer-related monologues of all time. I won't say anything more than that, because it's one of those things where you'll enjoy it even more if you have no idea what to expect. And that's it for now. See you in the next one.